Hi, and welcome to the Low Level Devil Channel's Raspberry Pi Pico series. In the first part of this series, I'm going to focus on integrating the Pico with the 6502 processor. If you aren't familiar with the 6502 processor, it's the same processor that was used in many popular 80s retro gaming systems, such as the Atari, Nintendo, Commodore 64, and many others. Some of you who are fans of Ben Eater's YouTube channel will be familiar with this one as well, as he goes over creating your own computer from scratch using this processor. In this video, I'm going to focus on using the Pico as the ROM, RAM, and clock for the 6502 processor. We're going to use the most of the GPIO pins that the Pico exposes, as well as an I2C breakout board and a couple of simple momentary push buttons. The major parts of this project are, of course, the Pico, a W65C02 processor, and a PCF8574 breakout board. The W65C02 is used in place of the original 6502 as it allows you to run below 1 MHz, so you can step to the code slowly and see it working. Here in the bottom corner of the screen you can see my messy breadboard setup. How it looks isn't really important. More importantly, I'll walk you through the schema of the project. So let's get started. I'll put a link to the schema in the description, so I'm not going to go too deeply over it, but you can see all the connections here. We, we have the data connections all go to this breakout board for I2C, all the address lines go to GPIO lines on the Pico. We have a couple of switches for resetting the Pico and for resetting the 6502 processor. So let's get into the code here. First we want to start by creating a file called cmakelists.txt. This is a cmake file. And we'll start with the uh, minimum version. So minimum required, I'll just use version 3.13. And we want to include the Pico SDK import.cmake file, which we'll copy from the SDK. We call this project, just for lack of a better name, test project. And we want to call the Pico SDK init. Add an executable, which we're going to call test, and we'll give it the test.c file. Now we call pico enable stdio usb for the test app and we want to set to 1 and we're going to do the same for uart but we're going to set it to to 0 because we don't want to use uart as our serial communication. So now we have pico add extra outputs test and our target link library so we're going to have test, we'll have the pico underscore std, oh, yeah, std lib, and hardware underscore i2c. So that should do it for our CMake file. Next we can go over to create a new file called test.c, and this will be the actual code for our project. We're just going to use one file since this is a pretty simple project, about 200 lines of code. Start by in including the pico SD stdlib, the stdio.h, hardware i2c.h, and pico slash binary underscore info.h. Now we're going to create a couple constants here, one for the base bus address, which we're going to put as 0x8000, and one for the base mem address. This one will do 0x1000. And now a define, we'll call this i2c underscore port, 
you want to use I2C0 as the port we're going to use. Now we're going to have a static unsigned char mem. This is going to be our memory. For now I'm just going to put 8 bytes of data there. So we'll have 8 bytes of memory. You're not limited to that of course, but for now I'm just using this. And now I want to have another static unsigned char for the code. This is the code that would run on the 6502 processor. For now it's going to be empty. We'll get to that later. I'll put some comments up here just so we're sure what this means. So code to run on the 6502 processor. Okay, now I'm going to create a couple constants for the other pins. We have the clock pin is pin 9 and the RW pin is pin 8. We'll get into more into those later. So now we'll have a, a array that we're going to use for the address pins. These are going to be the A0 through A15 address lines and these are the GPIO pins that those are connected to which you'll see in the schema. 14. 13, 12, 11, and 10. Now we'll create a function to actually write data. And this will write it using the I2C adapter that we have. So we'll pass in the value that we want to write. And I'm going to just do a little check here for a little error check handling. Um, so we'll call I2C underscore write underscore blocking. Give the I2C port and I2C adder which we haven't created. I'll add that up here and I know f for the default address for this device is 0x20. We'll pass in the address of val1 and false. So if it fails I'm just gonna actually it'll be ne less than 0 less than or equal to 0 if it fails. So if it fails I'm just gonna print out failed to write to I2C. And next I'm going to just set up a quick utility function. This part isn't as important, I'm just going to breeze through it. So I'm creating a, a little function that's going to scan the bus to find the address of your uh, I2C device you have connected. That's the PCF8574 that I'm using to read and write the data lines. So I'm just going to kind of breeze through this function because it's not really as relevant as the rest of the code. At the beginning of it, I'm going to sleep for five seconds. That way, it'll give us some time to actually um, start our screen utility to read the serial data output from the USB. That's one small issue with it is if you if you don't sleep at the start, you can't see the startup messages. So that's what that's there for. And what this code is essentially going to do is just scan the uh, available the possible um, device addresses and it's going to print out an at symbol when it finds one that, that when it finds a valid device and then it'll sleep for two seconds so you have time to look at it before it starts so now let's go on to our int main back to the more relevant code here so the very first thing is we're using this stdio in it all and then in it i2c with the I2C port 100 times a thousand for timeout. So now that we initialized the I2C, let's take a look at our diagram again. Let's zoom in and you see GPIO5 and GPIO4. Those are the two that are connected to the SDA and SCL. So those are the GPIOs that we need to initialize for I2C. So first we need to set 4's GPIO function to I2C and the same for 5. And then the other call that we need to make is the GPIO pull up to pull those to add the pull up resistors to them for 4 and 5. Now those two are set up for I2C. Oh, and we need to add this bi-directional support for 
four, five, and GPIO Funk I2C. So those two pins are all set up. Next we can call this GPIO init for the clock. And the clock is going to be an output, so we want to call GPIO set dear clock GPIO out. And the other pin that we were using was the GPIO init RW. It's the read write flag. And that's an input because we want to know what state the processor is in. So we're going to make that an input. And then we'll call our scan bus function. Now let's move on to the main while loop. So just while true. So while true, we want to pulse the clock and do the main operations of the program. So let's take a look at the data sheet here on page, let's see, 26. This has the timing diagram, and the timing diagram is important because it will tell you when things get set. This PHI2, that is your clock signal. So when the clock signal goes low, that's when things start happening. That's when the A0 through A15 gets set up. It's when the RW flag gets set up. There's a small period of time that that takes, which is called TAH. And if you look up here, TAH has a minimum time of 10 nanoseconds. So we don't have to worry so much about reading after we set it low because it only takes 10 nanoseconds. Then when, it, when we set it high, that's when the actual write data is done. So, and then there's this minimum time that it takes or it's a, it's a maximum time so it'll take up to 140 nanoseconds for that to be done so that, that gives us we'll have plenty of time just sleeping a couple milliseconds will give us plenty of time to read that data that was written so these are all the different timings for the read and write operations that happen so let's go back to the code to see how we'll implement this so first I'm going to create a couple of variables and signed in one for data and the uint 8t for the value we're going to start it at 0xea that's the no op instruction by default we're just going to use that if we don't find any other value to set it as you can see that in the data sheet as well. Let me find it. It's either down here or above that. I scroll up. Oh, there it is. Here, page 22. So page 22 has all the instructions. So that's where you'll see EA. And uh, we'll, we'll put page 22 in the comment. And I'll put page 26 here. So now let's look at E. This is the first nibble, it's called, and then the second A. So E, A, you go down to there and you have no op. So that's where, and that's a type I, which means it's only going to be one byte. And actually we don't need that data variable, so I deleted that. So now we're going to call GPIO put and the value zero into the clock so that's going to set the clock low and after that I'm just gonna sleep for a couple of milliseconds it doesn't really matter probably one would be enough I'll just make it 10 so that gives enough time for all the data to be set up properly as we saw in the timing diagram so let's look here at all right, here, here's the pinout diagram in the data sheet. RWB, is, that's the pin, we're calling it RW in our code, but that's the pin that's going to decide whether it's reading or writing. And let me just search for it, let's find. So if we look here in the data sheet, it's our bus enable section. These are all 
the descriptions of the different pins. So here we go. RWV is the output signal. is con is used to control data transfer. When in a high state, it is reading from memory or I/O. When in a low state, it contains valid data to be written from the microprocessor. So now we'll, we'll just want to add a little boolean to check for that value. So is read is GPIO get RW. So if that's high, then of course we know it's reading. So I'm going to create another variable called the full address. We want to read the address from the bits. And we're just going to loop through all 16 of the address lines. And we'll do int bit equals GPIO get for that specific address pin. And if it's high, then we'll say 1, otherwise 0. And now for the full address, we want to OR it with the value of that bit shifted over by I. So that will, after going through all 16, give us the full value of that address. Now we want to find out, is this an address that's on the PICO bus, which we have our two bus values we set for the base address for the bus and base mem bus. If you remember up here so you want to just see if it's on the bus because if it's not then we probably want to read the value that the processor wrote in there so if it's not a read or it's not on the pico bus then we want to read that value but in order to read that value first we have to write all ones to the PCF8574. So on the data lines, we need to write all ones before we can read. And if you remember, it's not going to actually put data on the bus until it goes high. So we're still in the low state. So it's safe to write to this. That's just an issue with how the PCF8574 works. So I'll put that in a comment here so you understand why it's used. So next when the 6502 starts up or when the reset is set to high it goes to something called the startup vector. After a few ticks it'll go to the address FFFC and read the first byte. So it's actually it reads two bytes from there. So it'll read the two bytes where you want to have the program counter point to when it starts running the code. So what we want to do is once we have the full address as FFFC, we want to grab those first two, the bottom two bytes, or the bottom byte of the bus address at zero, 00. We'll set that as our val and write it to the I2C bus. And now if the full adder is FFFD, the second byte, we'll write that f first section, which in order to do that, we're just gonna take the base address, shift it over by, no, not four, shift it over by eight, and then again, mask it to grab that first byte. Zero XFF, and write that. So that will write the address to the data line and the that will tell the processor to set the program counter to that value so that the next byte being read will be read from this address. So now let's check if the address is for code. So if the address is for code then it should be greater than the base bus address and less than the base bus address plus the size of the code. So if it is, all we want to do is set the value to the code at indexed full address minus base bus address and write that to the data bus.
so that the processor will read that value. Now let's say if it's a memory address, because if it's a memory address, it should be greater than the base mem address and less than the base mem address plus the size of the memory. For now it's just 8 bytes, but you, know, you can make it any size you want really. And now if is mem address and we're in read mode, because remember we haven't set the clock high yet, so now we want to read that value. Which is, we simply we do the same thing we did for the code section. Minus base mem address. And write the data to the I2C bus. Okay, I'm going to add a comment here. Check if the address is for memory. Now we should be done with all that we really need to do for reading, so I'm just going to sleep another 5 milliseconds. Probably not necessary, but anyway. Now I'm going to say if is mem address. Or actually, no, first we want to set the clock high. So <clears throat> GPIO put clock 1. So this will set the clock high. And if you remember from our timing diagram, what happens then is the processor is going to write data to the data bus if it needs to, if it has a command to write data. So then I'm going to just sleep 5 milliseconds after that, give it plenty of time to set up the write data. So if it's a memory address and not reading, I mean we're writing, then just simply going to set the memory at that location to the value that we read. Oh, actually, we don't know the value yet, so first we go we're going to need to actually read it. So if not is read, and it's not is on the PICO bus so this means we're going to be reading some value likely from memory so we're setting value to zero first and now we're going to actually read I2C port at the address I2C adder address of value one and false and again if and is less than or equal to zero, we'll just print out a warning message here. Fail to read 22x. Okay, so now we'll actually have the value, so we'll put that in memory if we're in the memory region. Next we want to do some printing, so I'm going to print the address a 4-bit, for a uh, space hex two spaces for the data the direction whether it's a read or a write and here on the next line I'll just put those values full adder val and if it is read we'll do r otherwise w Okay, so that's the per first part of our print line, and if it's a write, I'm going to actually print out each of the bits individually for the value that we read that the processor returned. So looping from bit 7 down to bit 0, and we'll simply do printf percent %d, let's see value shifted over by i and 1. So that'll give us that bit number. So prints the output of the bit or we read from the processor. Okay, That just makes it a little easier to see the data being manipulated by our writes. Otherwise I'm just going to print out 8 spaces 
that way all the lines are in order okay so next we'll print out um, I guess the memory region remember we had eight different bytes so I'm just gonna do eight two byte sections two character sections for the bytes and mem zero through seven it's just something that makes it easy to see the status of the memory as we go through each of the commands and when I say commands I mean the opcodes given to the, the 6502 processor okay and we'll put a return at the end and I think that's gonna be it I'm gonna sleep for 250 milliseconds just to give us some space in between these ticks so we can actually look at the data so now let's go on to the actual 6502 code and essentially so we're gonna go to the data sheet and find that section where it had the opcodes essentially we're gonna be writing machine code here these are the assembly instructions and the the matrix the value is actually the machine code for that instruction so we're just gonna write binary hex machine code so the first thing we're gonna do is call LDY which is a zero and it takes an this is an, an immediate instruction so it and takes a one byte number so a zero and I want to set Y to zero so a0, 0, 0, 0 is essentially calling the assembly instruction LDY00. Next we're going to go to, let's see, CLC and CLV are the next two instructions that we want to call. One will clear the carry flag, the other will clear the overflow flag. I'm just trying to clear these values out before we start actually running our program in case there was junk in those fields pr previous so let's see CLC is 0x18 and CLV is 0xb8 CLV so let's see next we are going to call STY STA we want to store the value of A which is 8D store the value of A and th this little lowercase a means it's a memory address that we want to pass in so it's actually going to be three bytes the STA actually first we want to load a let's let's load a value into a first so let's see LDA is AA. So 0x AA or A9, sorry, is we're going to put F0 as the value of our A register. If you're not fam familiar with the registers, their registers are X and Y, and then A is the accumulator. So now that we have A, let's store it. So we loaded A. Let's find where is the store X, store A. There it is, 8D. So 8D is the store A command, and it'll take in the address that we want to store it at. And if you remember, we have our memory address. So let's see, 8D. And essentially, we want to store this at base mem address. So in order to do that, I'm just going to create a simple macro here I'll call it adder to two bytes so pass in an address and I'm gonna essentially just say the first the low byte shift it over to get the high byte so it's essentially gonna put it in our array that we're building just by putting that <coughs> So that's going to be STA 
0x1000. So this way we'll be able to actually see in our memory output the value of A. So next let's do something to A. Let's call this rotate right here. So this is 6, 6, um, actually this was the one, ROR on uppercase A, that, that will operate on the accumulator, so 6A. So if we call 0x6A, that's going to rotate the bits of the accumulator to the right. And this is why I'm printing out the individual bits when we read data that the processor wrote. That way we can actually see this rotate happening. So I'm just going to copy and paste this a few times so you can see it moving over. So we'll rotate it right a few times and then we'll take that value of A and we'll store it into X. So TAX is transfer A to X. And that is a I type, which means it's just one byte. So AA will transfer the value of A to X. So now that we have X in its own, X having the value, let's see, let's do the store X, which will be STX up here. There we go. So 8E. E, and that will take in an address. So now we'll call 0x8E. And we'll use the base mem address, but we'll put this in the second byte. So we'll just say base mem address plus 1. So that'll put it in 0x1001, which would be the second byte in our mem array. Now let's do an operation on x. We'll make a simple one, inx, which is increment x. And that's an i type, so it's just one byte. So let's see, 0xe8, so increment x x plus plus it's basically x plus plus so now let's call that a few times so each time we write it we're gonna each time we update it we're going to write it to that same memory address so now that we're done playing around with x if you remember we set y to 0 at the very start so now we want to increase y so Y we're going to use as our counter for how many times we loop in this program. C8, increase Y, Y++. plus plus. So now that we've increased Y, let's loop. We'll loop back to the beginning. And for that we need the jump instruction. Actually first we'll store Y. Yeah, We want to store that so in our memory so we can see it. So 8C, and we'll use this same address to two bytes, we'll just store it at the next byte, 1002. So now we'll jump back to the beginning. We don't want to jump right back to the start, though we want to jump back here. So let's see, jump that takes an address is 4C. So 0x4c, add our two bytes, and this time we're going to use the base bus address plus 4. And that's 1, 2, 3, 4. So it should start right here. So this is essentially going to infinitely loop our program printing out these results. Let's see if this thing compiles now. Um, let's see. We'll make a directory build. Go into that build directory. 
and we'll call cmake dot dot and it looks like there was an error that's because I forgot to copy this file so we need this file from our SDK pico SDK import so cp our pico underscore SDK underscore path tools no it's not tools it's external pico SDK import and we'll copy that back one directory and if you don't know how to set up this SDK I have another video that you can watch that shows how to set it up just how I used it here so I'm going to remove that build directory recreate it make dir build cmake dot dot it says that generating is done now let's just call make and build it and we have one error uh, looks like I just fought, forgot a semicolon that's not bad for what 200 lines of code one syntax error all right, so yeah, about 200 lines of code. So it looks good. Now we have the now we want to mount our Pico. And again, I show how to do all this in the previous video, so you can watch that if you're not familiar. So I'm going to mount my Pico. And then let's look at the files. See test.uf2. So I want to copy that to my mounted pico rpip2. And that's going to immediately, let me sudo d message, that's going to show the device location. So tty acm0. Actually, first let me fix a couple things with the code that I just found wrong. First of all, before scan bus, let me set up these GPIO address pins. I need to initialize those and I need to set them to input because I need to be able to read the address. If you don't do that, you, this won't work very well. <laughs> okay, and also in my scan, I had one little problem here. Just set this adder percent 16 equals zero. All right, so now I'll go back, rebuild it, copy it over, and I can run my screen command. I'll put that command in the comments. You can see right there on two zero is where it detected the device. So I'm going to let this run. I'm pushing down the reset button and then let go. I'm going to run for a minute, and I'm just going to pause it. Okay. Okay, I'll pause it there. So you need to hold down the reset button for the 6502 for at least two clock cycles. And then it'll, after about seven ticks, it'll start reading the address. And if you look at the very top here, you can see the address is FFFC. And then the second line is FFFD. So you'll see the data it read on the first line is zero. The data it read on the second line is that 80, which is our bus address. So then it starts moving onto the code, and if you remember, A0 is the, uh, let's see, that's the load Y value to 0, which is the next byte, 8 on 8001, 8002. It's calling our CLC, and then our CLV, and you'll see some of these, if you just look through these, you'll see some of the lines, actually, are there's it displays more than once, like 8004. It, it displays twice. That's because that A9 requires more than one clock, se clock cycle to process. So if you just run through here and you eventually see the right down, it says address 1000 and it's writing F0 and you see the bits that I wrote there. So 11110000. Then after that we have the rotate write instruction followed again by storing the value of A into that same location. And you see the next time it prints out the value it's writing, all the bits are shifted over one, and then again, and then again, and again. And then down to the last one, you see it's transferring that value to X, which you see in the second byte of memory now. is The first byte of memory, the second byte of memory was 15 for a while. That's because it was some just data that was uninitialized in there. 
but then it moves the value of a into x and copies it into that value so you see 0f is in there now too. So let's run this just a little bit longer and now you'll see it's starting to increment the value of x so it's 10 and 11, 12, 13 in hex of course 14, 15 and then we'll see now it, that 1 is y updating and then you can see it loops back to 8004 and it's in its loop now so here we go back in the loop and I think this is a good introduction to how to work the 6502 processor using the Raspberry Pi Pico as a driver. If you find this interesting, let me know. I'm, I was thinking about maybe doing some more videos on just different interactions with that processor in the Pico because the Pico has so many GPIO output ports and it's only a $4 microcontroller. You really can't beat it. So again, if you enjoyed this video, and you learned something for it go ahead and like and subscribe put some comments uh, you know join our reddit channel you can always ask more extensive questions there everybody's happy to answer so again thanks for watching